Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and species of all kinds. Today we have our first unsolved murder case in a location that I can almost guarantee nobody is going to be able to guess, because I sure as heck did not. So as usual, I'm going to turn it over to my baby bear, who is going to give us a little synopsis of our story before we get into our fun fact. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thanks. So, actually, they can guess where this is at because it's in the title of today's episode. But, yeah, it's our first unsolved murder case. There's four teenage girls involved, all murdered, and it's unsolved still. We have somewhat of a resolution, but it turns out to kind of fall apart on us. So, yeah, go ahead and tell me a fun fact so we can get into the case. All right. So, our fun fact is about our lovely creature, the sloth. Overrated. Not as cute as people say. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're fugly, but they're so adorable at the same time. I have actually two parts, so there's two facts of this. One is more of the scientific, because, you know, you know me. The second one's kind of a gross factor, but still kind of interesting at the same time. But So we'll start with the first one. So we all know that sloths are notoriously slow-moving. They spend all their time hanging upside down in trees and eating and sleeping. And a lot of people think that they move so slow to blend in with their surroundings and their environment and stuff like that, so they're not as, you know, big of prey. But it actually goes much deeper than that. So as we've all learned and have been told since high school, and we've all read the memes about mitochondrial DNA. It's the powerhouse of the cell. Yeah, (laughs) that it is the powerhouse of the cell. It's what provides cells with the energy it needs to perform act uh perform reactions all right but because of our uh, with this in fact uh, this in mind it gives us the ability of how fast we move how fast we move sloths actually don't have as much mitochondrial dna as most other animals so it's not the fact that they move slow by choice it's the fact that they literally physically cannot move any faster or react any faster than they do so they're not lazy they're physically handicapped yeah yeah give them give them a disability sticker and a little parking parking spot (laughs) that'd be weird what's your other fact that was gross so another fact is since sloths spend so much time in trees hanging upside down pretty much eating and sleeping is their life They're, they're living the dreams they only come down from their tree about once a week and that's to do one thing that's to defecate to poop fun now in doing so they will actually lose or defecate one third of their body weight once a week once a week they'll lose a third of their body weight once a week what are they eating up in the trees to make up that weight whatever they can find leaves bark bugs Mm. that doesn't sound fun yeah eat and sleep Eat, sleep, poop. You think they get hemorrhoids? I don't know. You think? I mean, maybe they're used to it. I guess. Not. I mean, I guess by des- they're 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 made this way by design. So. I guess not. Strong butts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if if anyone actually look looks it up, I actually watched a video of it. It's. Weird. I'm not watching that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty interesting. It's weird looking. Well, thanks. Yeah. Maybe next time, not give me a pooping fact to react to, but hey, you know. I gotta keep them on their toes. <laughs> All right, well, anyways, are you ready to get into today's case? Absolutely. Let's do it. Okay, so today's story takes place in Austin, Texas. Have you ever been to Texas? I actually have. My dad, back in the day, was stationed somewhere in there, but, and I spent, you know, some of vacation or something like summer vacation I used to spend with him but it was when I was so little like I have maybe one or two distinct memories so I would have to say no but I have spent some time in okay, Texas. Okay so only technically. I just don't remember. Okay so this story takes place in Austin Texas on December 6 1991 and I, I can't believe it's yogurt shop which I've never heard of but it reminds me of, like the butter like I can't believe it's not butter which I mean isn't that just canola no it's it's margarine. I and mean, you can't believe it's not butter, it's margarine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, usually it's either margarine or it is some sort of like buttered canola, canola oil okay. type well, stuff. <laughs> I've never heard of this yogurt place, but maybe it's not around anymore. It might be. I don't know. But it's an I can't believe it's yogurt shop. For that fact, what is margarine? Margarine? Yeah. It's not butter. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't know. It's like, for that fact, what the f- Oil? <laughs> 
Fat, I guess? Rendered I don't fat? know. I don't know. Anyways, there was two employees working at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop that night. Their names were Eliza Thomas and Jennifer Harbison. They were both 17 years old. They were working the late shift to start at 7 p.m. And they were going to work until a little after 11 when the shop closed. Personally, I think that's really late for a yogurt shop to be open. But it is a city, so maybe not. But it was like a little shopping complex and everything else was closed. I'm in Texas, man. If it's if it's hot in Texas, I keep those ice cream shops open until like 2 in the morning. We live in Florida. Nothing's late. <laughs> Yogurt's not open that late. So they should open like an ice cream shop next to a bar. Get all the drunk people out there. And then start selling or advertising like their rum stuff. Oh, when I was living in PA, I heard about a place in New York. Uh, that, Or at least at the time, that was the only place you could get it. So we've all heard of the, like the wine ice cream. Yeah. It, where it's actually alcoholic, like 5% or so. Yeah, it's, sounds it's weak, but whatever. They made some, what is it, some sort of like actual like liquor ice cream where it was strong. I, for the life of me, I can't remember the the alcohol by volume content, but it was strong. We gotta make that. I know. I could. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know how to make ice cream, but you know. I can. I know how. <laughs> Actually, when I was in uh, when I was in PA, so I made I made ice cream from scratch when I was in high school because my senior year I was in I was in an ad class just for a free credit. It's pretty fun actually, but we made uh, we made fresh ice cream, and then again when I was going to Pennsylvania, uh, Penn State, for my uh, molecular cell biology course and stuff like that, I helped out one of the chemistry teachers with some fun experiments and stuff. We had like uh, parents and stuff come in, and we did something fun for them. So we actually made ice cream using liquid nitrogen because it, Just make, because it makes it made great it all ice smoky? cream. Yeah, well, that and it, it it froze the the cream fast. It's a lot faster to make it with liquid nitrogen. Well, you need to maybe some alcoholic ice cream, apparently. Yeah, it's fun. I can make the alcohol and I can make the ice cream. Putting them together shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, it might be too liquidy, you know. It's like, you know, because alcohol doesn't freeze. Anyways, back to the story. We have two girls, Eliza and Jennifer, both seventeen, working the late shift at the ice cream shop. They close at eleven, which I still think is weird, but they were gonna stay open a little bit later so that they could clean up the store and cash everything out. So there were two other people there that night. It was Jennifer's little sister, Sarah Harbison, who was 15, and her friend, who was 13, Amy Ayers. They went to the mall together. When they got done at the mall, they decided to help the girls clean up, and they were going to have a sleepover at their house. So there was four girls there that night at the shop when they closed at 11 p.m. So Jennifer was in the lobby restocking everything, putting the chairs on the table, filling up napkin containers, all that stuff, cleaning down everything. And then Eliza was up front cleaning the back of the counter and bringing up the last few customers that were coming in. Now we have three witnesses right before close that night that saw different things. So we have a description of a tan boy sitting rattling something in a bag at a booth along with a man in a military fatigue jacket. This man was also seen letting everyone in front of him at the line to get yogurt and everything. But the two boys ended up just getting Coke, like a can of Coke, which is just weird, honestly. You're in an ice creamy, yogurty place. Order that. And they weren't even talking to each other. They were just sitting there awkwardly staring at each other and probably eavesdropping on the girls' conversations that night right before close. That even sounds like whatever because you got someone playing with a bag, which I assume would probably be one of the guns or something. And then a dude, a kid in a military fatigue, which means he probably has a military father, which means back, which means though. back then it probably wasn't that good of a family relationship. I'm going I'm to say psychopath right there. I'm going to scream psychopath. You're going to scream psychopath because someone's wearing a military fatigue jacket and it's like a style And being statement weird and sketchy in an ice cream shop? Yeah. I mean, it's yogurt. Why do you keep calling it ice cream? But it's yogurt. <laughs> Close enough. We can't believe it's yogurt. Yeah. Yeah, but he was acting all weird. And there was one guy holding a bag. They couldn't tell if it maybe he was Hispanic or just really tan. And then the other one was just being weird, letting everyone in front of him at the line. And eventually just ordered a soda. And the guys weren't talking to each other. So, like, that's stupidly weird, right? Oh, yeah. So the last two witnesses left the store at 10.47 p.m. The two men were still inside sitting in the booth closest to the register. So the store's policy was for at 10.50, the girls to lock the door from the inside so the customers could still like finish up the yogurt and leave, but other customers couldn't come in so they could have time to clean up and close the store because nobody likes that last person to like, come in store and like, one minute till close. Screw that person. I mean, I've been that person once or twice, but I felt real bad about it. <laughs> And I've been the person receiving that person multiple times. Oh, yeah. Was- and some are great. Some are like, you know, you don't mind helping. Some you just want to kick in the head. Oh, yeah, especially when they keep shopping for stuff. Like, leave. What are you yeah. doing? The yeah. lights are off. 
Yeah. The worst people of all time. Drop but, <laughs> Yeah, these two boys were still in the store at 10.50, and then we don't really know how long everything, you know, went on after that. So the store was almost cleaned up at that point. It looked like all the chairs, except for the one booth where the boys were at, was on the table. I also forgot to mention there were, like, teenage boys. It's probably pretty relevant. They're teenage age. But... Yeah, everything except that one booth was cleaned up. Nothing was restocked and the chair was off, the, still on the floor and everything else was on the tables. So we know that these two boys were the last two customers to come into the store and stay the longest. Now at 11.03, Eliza, who was working behind the register, pressed a no cash sale. So honestly, I presume they're getting robbed. There was only $500 in the register, which doesn't seem worth it to me. But $500 yeah, but to teenagers that. is a lot of money. But yeah. like how much money you can get out of a yogurt shop? Can't be worth it. I don't know. It depends on how hot it was that day. <laughs> that is such a weird answer. I mean, you're right, but that's such a weird answer. Anyways, the next thing we know from 11.03 when that cash sale, the no cash sale is pressed, is 11.47 a police officer sees smoke coming from the yogurt shop and calls it in. Now the fire department comes and they screw up the scene right off the gate. They didn't know it was a crime scene, obviously, because you obviously think if it's like a restaurant or a business, maybe there was an oven on after they closed and something like that caused a fire. So they start spraying the scene with water and putting out the fire and contaminating all the evidence because it is, we're on a true crime podcast. It's a crime scene. But they actually saw some feet sticking out. They said they might have actually trampled over some bodies at some point because they didn't know it was a crime scene going in there with all the smoke. But eventually they did realize there's a couple bodies on the floor. So the first thing they saw was a stack of two bodies, which were Eliza and Sarah. They were stacked on top of each other next to the back door. They were bound, gagged, and naked. And kind of, I mean, we couldn't tell from their bodies what exactly happened to these two because their bodies were so damaged by the fire. Their bodies were not tested for accelerant. Someone said that styrofoam cups had an accelerant used nearby but we don't know if actually the fire caught onto the girls first if there was anything used on them because their bodies weren't tested and then the other girl jennifer was nearby off of the stack of the two she may have actually been stacked with them and then the body had fallen off this just sounds brutal (laughs) doesn't it but she was nearby now those are the three oldest girls the youngest girl amy was actually towards the first half of the store it's presumed That maybe she had been stacked with the girls, the other girls to begin with, and she had maybe crawling away from the scene towards the front door. She was still alive when the paramedics got on the scene, but she died shortly after on scene. So she didn't make it very far, and she actually was the farthest from the base of the fire, so we have the most damage to her body known. She was raped. One of the other girls had an ice cream scoop between her legs. And Amy's body also had a beating on her. So the other three were pretty damaged. You couldn't get the most information off them. But Amy was farther away, like I said. And she had noticeable beatings and bruising on her face. She was also tested for rape kit and had DNA inside of her. But she also had two gunshots. The other three girls were shot with the 22 caliber rifle, which is pretty... I think it's pretty pathetic if you're going to commit a crime, a twenty two. It just seems like a weaker of a weapon. If you're going to go in there, go in there heavy, I guess. It's what you use for squirrel hunting. So it's a typical teenager's... Yeah. Any, any teenager back then would probably have it if they live out in the sticks. Yeah, and you can be super weak and there's no kickback with it, so you're going to be fine. But it's not like carrying like a real gun around, I guess. It's still a gun. I mean, obviously they died from it. But it's not, it's not something a professional hitman would carry on them. But she had a gunshot wound with a 22 that didn't kill her, so she was also shot a second time with a 380 caliber gun. Is that stronger? Hmm. It's bigger. Okay. Is it still a handgun? Because this is a 22 handgun. You, a 22 does come in a long rifle, though. But this was a handgun. Yeah. But is that, like, heavy heavy or, like, medium heavy? A 308 or 380? 380. 380, I would think, would be heavier. Because I know a 308, for a fact, is a much, much bigger slug um a 380 would be even bigger than that so but it's still something you think of like a teenager could get their hands on oh no uh, no not unless their dad has it right and like they, i think they, a teenager can get a 22 pretty easily right. but a 380 can they get that as easily mm-hmm. no so amy was shot that second time with a 380 however gun and she still survived like we said she was still on scene alive which is pretty torturous for a 13 year old girl to like get beaten, get raped, and get shot twice and still survive, especially with smoke inhalation and everything, that's pretty brutal. But that's all we really know about the scene, per se, except that, obviously, someone did this that's unknown. 
So eight days after the initial crime, at a local mall nearby, Maurice Pierce, who was 16 years old, was arrested for carrying a 22 caliber handgun and was questioned for the crime because it was a matching weapon. Now, upon further investigation and testing, the gun was not a match. We did not know this originally when they were first questioned. So when Maurice went for questioning, he pointed the finger at his friend, Forrest Welburn, who was 15 years old. He said that he borrowed the gun from Maurice and that Forrest had, been, had to be the one who committed this crime. Now, Forrest claimed that night he and Maurice and two other friends were joyriding in a stolen car, so they couldn't possibly have been on the scene. So, technically, Maurice would know if Forrest did this or not, but a, a scared teenager could point the finger at anybody. You know, especially if you're running in a bad crowd, just blame the other bad kid. So, in 1996, a new investigator was assigned to a case, and in 1999, they really did take a breakdown and, like, really further examine these four boys in question, Maurice, Forrest, Michael, and Robert. So when they got in for questioning, Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott were the two who kind of cracked under the pressure of the investigation and the interrogation. Michael confessed first and he kind of pointed the finger to other people. He confessed after being led into a confession by really harsh interrogators who even like brought out a gun and was like, is this the one you did to kill the girls? And put it to the back of the kid's head, which I think is very intimidating. Again, he's not a kid at this point because it's several years later, but it's still very intimidating. If you listen to the tape or watch it on YouTube, they're very aggressive and they're really leading them. And if they get the answer wrong, they're telling them to correct it. They're like, no, you did this. Did you do this? Which is illegal. You cannot, <laughs> you know, do this. And another fact about the case that is really weird is that over 50 people falsely confessed to this crime and they kept getting ruled out. So every time someone was questioned, by these people, by these police officers, people would confess. We even had a serial killer, the broomstick murderer, Kenneth McDuff, say he did this crime. Of course, eventually he said no, he didn't, but tons of people, there was a lot of like teenage couples coming in to confess to the crime. Like a, I don't know, like a weird thing to do to me because it was a two people crime that they say. It was like two people in the scene, like the two boys. But a lot of people falsely confessed to this. But since they had something to link, these two teenagers that confessed, they, you know, they took it as them because no one else had anything to back it up with, but they had this connection to Maurice who had a 22. So Michael confessed first, like I said, and it was followed by Robert. So Robert would have actually cracked under the pressure after several hours of interrogation. First, he, when he started out being interrogated, he was very adamant that he had nothing to do with this and he was really holding in strong, but they eventually broke him down over time. And Michael Scott in the interrogation room was quoted as saying, you scared the shit out of me. And the officer replied by, I meant to scare the shit out of you. So they were being really harsh to these kids. And uh, you can't do that. I mean, back in 1999, they didn't really know as much about false confessions as we do now. And it's very common. It doesn't matter. You still can't force a confession. I don't think you can put a gun to someone back of their head. Loaded or not. He said he used his finger, but like you had a gun in the back of this kid's head in the interrogation room. That's terrifying. So there was no physical evidence to tie any of the boys to the crime, but since Robert and Michael confessed, they were actually only two to go to trial. The men said they used an accelerant, but that since there was never any accelerant tested on the bodies, we don't know if that's true. There were a lot of the facts wrong against the case. And then both men were actually convicted after this first trial. They say a lot of the pressure to convict these boys came from the jury seeing crime scene photos that were really graphic over and over again and really wanting someone to be punished for it, and that really influenced the jury. One other thing that influenced the jury was that the other boys, like the other one's confession was used against the other one, but they weren't actually brought to court and they both recanted their statements after the initial confession. So they used the other boy's confession against them, pointing the finger at the other one in trial. So eventually they did retest all the DNA, and especially the rape kit. It's been several years since the crime and they kept the DNA and DNA advancements had made a huge change since then. So. The DNA tested from inside of Amy's body. There were two unknown male DNA profiles found. Neither of them matched either one of the four boys. So in 2009, all the charges were dropped and they were released. Now they could still be recharged in the future if more information was found. They just decided not to pursue that at this time, especially until they find out whose DNA was actually inside of Amy. We can only hope that, you know, later down the line, somehow, uh, you know, we, we are able to link you know, a DNA match through, you know, I know nowadays a lot of killers are being caught thanks to like things like ancestral DNA and stuff like that using familiar DNA and, and things like that, uh, that are catching a lot of, a lot of killers these days. So you want to know something disappointing? What? We have a familiar DNA test match for this case. 
but the DNA sample was given to the FBI for testing and like research purposes, and it's not able to be used in a chemical, criminal investigation since it's not 100% match. So they have a DNA profile similar to one of the profiles found inside of Amy, but since it was used for research purposes and because it's not a 100% match, you're not able to actually test it and like identify who it is who donated the DNA. I personally think if it's like to do with a crime, give the DNA out, you know, like, you know, I know it's meant for testing purposes, but they volunteered their DNA and if it's not them, rule them out. Yeah. Now, after the charges were dropped against Michael and Robert, we don't actually have anything else. I mean, I have a fact about Maurice Pierce, like the guy who got arrested at the mall with the 22, if you want to hear what happened to him. Sure. So he was stopped in 2010 at a traffic stop and he was actually killed by police. Now, Maurice had been shot by a police officer after grabbing his knife and trying to stab the police officer. They said that he had a lot of mental issues, paranoia, anxiety, and always thought the police were after him after the initial investigation and really trying to pin this crime on him. But yeah, he was killed by police. So either he had something to do with it and he was felt guilty about it and that really left him in a messed up mental state, or he was just a victim of this, just like the girls. So what do you think about this case? Because that's all I really have for you today. Like, there was two boys there, but we don't know who they are. Yeah. Honestly, the only thing that I could have ever really recommend were, you know, back before Maurice died and everything. Because obviously he was, he got arrested for having a, a twenty two, you know, in the same general location. So... Rather than, you know, the investigators being poor investigators and trying to force a confession, I would have more so, you know, worked on either ruling him out and then if he did get ruled out, and it goes back to, you know, like, one thing is a coincidence, two things is a pattern, so, you know, you know a 22 was used, another kid, you know, whether he had anything to do with it or not, was arrested for having a 22 in the same general area. So I would have tried to have seen maybe they, they you know, the, the kids might know each other. Because, you know, normally that's just too big of a co- coincidence for me, especially if, you know, the investigators had nothing to go on. I would have tried to pry out from the kid who he knows, who his contacts he did. He are. He couldn't his friend forced for it, but, you know, he had an alibi. Blame the other two and they got arrested. Yeah. I mean, there's just so many things wrong with this case. Like, the police and fire department really messed up the scene the get-go. Not testing the bodies for accelerant. Not fingerprinting the bathroom where they said one of the men probably used. Not checking the lock on the back door. Like, there's a lot of things that could have been done better. Yeah. Of course, it also depends on how big the fire was. Because if the fire had spread to the bathroom, there would have been no point. There would have been no no fingerprints left. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the layout of the store. But I assume the front of the store where Amy was wasn't too damaged maybe the bathroom in the front of the store wasn't too damaged and honestly these two boys would still be in jail if it wasn't for them messing up the trial and not letting them confront their accuser so other than that though like i have zero idea why anyone would rob a yogurt shop why anyone would murder people in a yogurt shop like it's weird it's not i have i have no idea why so many people would confess to something people love attention this is something that happens all the time. People love to confess for things. Well, you know what you do? Lock them up. See if they feel like confessing. Even if you... <laughs> Some people are actually more fulfill- are more comfortable in jail. They like the street cred of the crime. When yeah, they do but it. if people are, you know, for those that just want the attention of confessing or whatever, I promise you they're not going to feel the same way after they spend some time. Yeah, I mean, I kind of get it when serial killers confess to the crime because they're already there forever. They want to have like a bare yeah. body count, I guess. But even the broomstick killer, Kenneth McDuff, who confessed to this crime, when he was getting executed, he was saying that, no, he didn't do this. If he did do it, he would have told you. But people just confess for no reason. People are stupid. Yes. Yes, they are. I don't confess to nothing. I would never take a polygraph. Do I really want to know what the broomstick killer did? (laughs) Do you want that to be our next episode? Maybe. Oh, it pisses me off when I found out about him. Yeah. No, it, it, no, it, the police messed that up. That's our next episode. We're going to do Kenneth McDuff. They messed that up. People died because of the cops. Didn't somebody have a recommendation? Oh, people always have recommendations. A lot of people want us to do Chris Watts. 
Because the new Netflix documentary came out about him. Who's by the way, he's not hot, you guys. Chris Watts is not hot. I don't care what people say, he's not. I don't get it. So every time I hear Chris Watt or whatever. Watts. (laughs) Yeah, Watts. I can only think of the famous actor that I know of, Chris Pratt. (laughs) Not the same. Nope, I know. There's a million Chris's in the world. Yes, yes, there are. But anyways, thank you so much for joining me for our episode. Oh yeah, can't wait till next week. Broomstick killer. Heck yeah. Sodomy. What? That's what it sounds like. <laughs> what it sounds like. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye. Ew. For the ASMR person. Ew. <laughs>